Welcome to The Brian Buffini Show, where we explore the mindsets, motivation, and methodologies of success. Here's your coach, Brian Buffini. Well, top of the morning to you, and welcome to the Brian Buffini Show. I have a real treat for you today, another hidden treasure, never before heard recording from the great Earl Nightingale. Uh, Now, if you haven't listened to it, please check out Earl's Strangest Secret, uh, which was episode 61 of the Brian Buffini Show. And then recently, episode 287 was the first in our series of Earl's Vault, Uh, just recordings that Diana Nightingale, Earl's widow, has uh, asked me to share with the with the world, and uh, we're very very honored to do that. Now in today's episode, Earl is going to share a technique that he will tell you to use in your work life. But I've actually used this technique to solve problems in many areas of my life. So pay close attention to that. Another little heads up as we play these older recordings. Earl uses the term man a lot. Now he's not some misogynistic old curmudgeon. It's just 40 years ago, that phrase was commonly used to talk about humankind in general. And most of the time he uses it, he's using it in that context. Uh, I just don't want you to miss out on the, just the real meat and the, just the jewels that are here to be had by something that today might not be as culturally as acceptable. Uh, Earl's going to share how successful people are not just uh, people without problems. They are actually people who've learned how to solve their problems. And he's going to share a technique on how to do that. Uh, once again, I just want to thank Diana Nightingale for giving us the honor here at the Brian Buffini Show to play these never-before-heard recordings. And uh, it's just a great honor for us to share them with all of you. Please enjoy. Take copious notes. Here's the great Earl Nightingale. I want to tell you about a plan you can follow which takes only one hour a day, five days a week, and which brings results out of all proportion to the time spent. We talked about the vital necessity of a goal to give you a clearer picture of the potential represented by the proper use of your mind. For a moment, consider the things your mind has brought you. Everything you have, your job, the money you earn, everything you own has come to you as a result of using your mind. The way most people use their minds can be compared to the time back in the early 19th century when just the eastern coast of the North American continent was settled, just a strip along the coast. To the west, there stretched the raw, undeveloped great bulk of what was later to become the incredibly rich 90% of the economy and standard of living we enjoy today. This message will show you how to use infinitely more of your mental powers. None of us, as a rule, has the slightest notion of the capabilities of his mind. But believe me when I say that your mind represents what can be compared to an undiscovered gold mine. And it makes no difference if you're 17 or 70. Look at it this way. Your goal is in the future. Your problem is to bridge the gap which exists between where you are now and the goal you intend to reach. This is the problem to solve. So now remember this. It was written by Robert Seashore, chairman of the Department of Psychology of Northwestern University. He said, successful people are not people without problems. They are simply people who have learned to solve their problems. And there you have it. Living successfully, getting the things we want from life is a matter of solving the problems which stand between where we now are and the point we wish to reach. No one is without problems. They're a part of living. But let me show you how much time we waste in worrying about the wrong problems. Here's a reliable estimate of the things people worry about. Things that never happen, 40%. Things over and past that can't be changed by all the worry in the world, 30%. Needless worries about our health, 12%. Petty miscellaneous worries, 10%. And real, legitimate worries, 8%. In short, 92% of the things the average person worries about take up valuable time and unnecessary worry. And of the real, legitimate worries, there are two kinds. There are the problems we can solve, and there are the problems beyond our ability to personally solve. 
But about 95% of our real problems can usually be said to fall into the first group, the ones we can solve if we'll learn how. There must be millions of people today who feel they're being barred from the life they want because they look upon problems not as challenges to be solved, but as bottomless chasms beyond their ability to bridge. A little research proves that successful people have the same kind of problems. So the whole thing boils down to a matter not of problems, which are common to us all, but of our ability to solve them. Now, I'm going to assume you've decided upon your goal. Your problem is, how do I achieve it? Your goal may be a promotion, a greater income, a beautiful home. It makes little difference what your goal happens to be. For a youngster, it could be better grades in school. For a secretary, a trip around the world. But you have your goal, and you know that you will become what you think about. That is, if you stay with it, you will reach your goal. But how? It's right here that your mind comes into play. Now, what is your mind? I think the best way to describe it is to quote something written by the great Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Archibald MacLeish. He wrote, The only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. This is absolutely true. The human mind is the one thing that separates us from the rest of the creatures on earth. Everything that means anything to us comes to us through our minds. Our love of our families, our religion, all of our knowledge, talents, abilities, everything is reflected through our minds. Anything that comes to us in the future will come to us as a result of the extent to which we use our minds. And yet, and I know you'll agree with me here, it is the last place on earth to which the average human being will turn for help. Our work has hidden within it untold opportunities. The same is true of our minds, but only if we will use them. In order to reflect just a moment on the human mind, consider what it has accomplished. As you do, realize that we are developing so rapidly that we have come farther in the realm of progress in the past 50 years than in all the preceding centuries of human civilization. Of all the scientists who ever lived, it is estimated that 90% of them are alive today. We have reached in the area of ideas and human advancement a plateau so high it was undreamed of by even the most optimistic forecasters as recently as 10 years ago. But every new idea triggers additional ideas, so that now we're in an era of compounding advancement on every front and in every area that almost staggers the imagination. From the rockets which probe the deep outer reaches of the universe to the great bridges which span our rivers, everything man-made you see and touch spawned from the most powerful agency in the world, the human mind, and you own one. Let me remind you of something. The 40-hour week has become fairly standard and is an imminent likelihood of being even further shortened. This means that the average working person has at his disposal a really enormous amount of free time. In fact, if you will total the hours he works and sleeps, counting weekends and holidays and vacations, and subtract them from the total waking hours of a year, you'll be amazed to find that of the 5,840 waking hours, if he sleeps eight hours every night, he spends only 1,912 on the job. This leaves him with 3,928, almost 4,000 hours a year when he is neither working nor sleeping. These could be called discretionary hours with which he can do as he pleases. Now, so that you can see the amazing results in your own life, I want to recommend that you take just one hour a day, five days a week, and devote this hour to exercising your mind. And remember what Archibald MacLeish said about it. It's your most valuable possession. It deserves some attention. Pick one hour a day upon which you can count. The best time is an hour before the family is up in the morning, at least it is for me. The mind is clear, the house is quiet, and if you like, with a fresh cup of coffee, this is the time to start the mind going. And here's how you do it. During this hour every day, take a completely blank sheet of paper. At the top of the page, write your goal, clearly, simply. Then, since our future depends upon the way in which we handle our work, write down 20 ideas for improving that which you now do for a living. 20 possible ways in which the work which fills your working day can be improved. Now remember two important points with regard to this. One, this is not particularly easy. And two, most of your ideas won't be any good. Now when I say it's not easy, I mean it's like starting any new habit. 
At first, you'll find your mind a little reluctant to be hauled up and out of the old familiar rut. But as you think about your work and ways in which it might be improved, write down every idea that pops into your mind, no matter how absurd it might seem. Now I'll tell you what'll happen. Some of your ideas will be good and worth testing on the job. The most important thing this extra hour accomplishes, however, is that it deeply embeds your goal into your subconscious mind, starts the whole vital machinery working the first thing every morning, and twenty ideas a day total a hundred a week. Even if you don't think on weekends, in doing this, you'll find that your mind will continue to work all day long. You'll find that at odd moments, when you least expect it, really great ideas will begin to pop into your mind. When they do, write them down as soon as you can. Remember, just one great idea can completely revolutionize your work. If you wanted to develop the muscles of your body, you'd take daily exercise of some sort. The mind is developed in the same way, except that the returns, as I said in the beginning, are out of all conceivable proportion to the time and energy spent. The mind of man can lift anything. His muscles, even the best developed, are puny alongside those of some of the dumbest animals on earth. If man had depended on his muscles for survival, he probably would have disappeared, as did the dinosaurs, which incidentally were the most physically powerful creatures that ever lived. I've used this system for years. And it has given me some of the most gratifying and rewarding experiences of my life. And it costs only five hours a week. Five out of a hundred and sixty-eight. Is it worth it? It's like spending five hours a week digging in a solid vein of pure gold, because your mind is all of that and so much more. Each time you write your goal at the top of the sheet of paper, don't worry or become concerned about it. Think of it as only waiting to be reached, a problem only waiting to be solved. Face it with faith, and bend all the great powers of your mind toward solving it. And believe me, solve it you will. This puts each of us in the driver's seat. We're no longer passengers aboard a train guided by some vague and nameless fate or circumstance, but rather we're engineers on a predetermined trip of our own choosing to the destination of our own selection. Now let's briefly recap. One. For the next month, spend one hour a day getting as many ideas as you can. Try at least twenty a day on ways to improve what you now do for a living, realizing that the achievement of your goal depends upon it, as does your whole future. If you do, I think you'll want to continue the practice. Two, if everything you now have is the result of using, say, ten percent of your mental ability, you can imagine what life will be like if you can increase this figure to fifteen or twenty percent or more. Three. Successful people are not people without problems. They are simply people who have learned to solve their problems. Four, don't waste time and energy worrying about needless things. Forty percent of them will never happen. Thirty percent have already happened and can't be changed. Twelve percent are needless worries about our health. Ten percent are petty miscellaneous worries, and only eight percent of them are real. Try to separate the real from the unnecessary and solve those which are within your ability to solve. Five. The human race has advanced farther during the past fifty years than in all the preceding centuries of human civilization. We're now living right in the middle of the golden age man has been dreaming of and praying for for centuries, and it's going to get better. Last of all, the only thing in the world that can take you to your goal in life is your mind, its effective use, and following through on the good ideas it supplies you. Each of us has a tendency to underestimate our own abilities. We should realize that we have deep within ourselves a reservoir of genius that can be tapped if we'll just dig deep enough. It's the miracle of your mind. Wow, some great stuff there, wasn't it? You know, I, I was just listening to that and how amazed Ur was about technology and. The developments in humankind at the time, and can you imagine what he would have thought of today? Can you imagine he would have thought of all the opportunities there are in today's world? Access to capital, access to technology, the ability to outsource things and have, you know, a little company be a big company. Wow, remarkable stuff. Now let me share with all of you here today how I've applied what you just heard. When Earl talks about taking an hour a day. To come up with twenty ideas at the end of a week, and you have on a hundred ideas. Not only does that sound overwhelming, it is overwhelming. 
But if you listen closely, Earl states what he's looking for is just one great idea. So don't get caught up in the 20. Don't get caught up in the 100. What this is is a time to think and brainstorm, and you're looking for one great idea. And you have to come up with a lot. Right? You've got to kiss a lot of frogs to find a prince or a princess. Same with ideas. And so uh, what he's actually challenging us to do is set aside time to think, which in our world today, look at your phone usage. Look at how much you're doing, how much Netflix, all the different stuff you're doing, how, all the Zoom calls, time, work. How much time are you taking to think? When we're in our cars, we're listening to stuff or music or whatever. How much time are we actually taking to think? For me, I go thinking on a beach walk. That's what I do. Or I'll, I, I'll, I have a step mill at home, and that's where I think. Kind of a monotonous, good exercise, what, so on and so forth. And I always have just a little black book and a pen so I can write down the thoughts and the ideas that come. But ultimately, we're looking for, for one. And so, uh, again, Earl was focused on all these ideas on your work life. Again, I use this for many areas of my life. Sometimes it was work, but sometimes it's been health. Sometimes it was on my family. Sometimes solving a particular problem coming up with solutions and uh, this technique has absolutely helped me put more of the good in my good life uh, I hope you enjoyed it I hope you listen to it at least six times I hope you join us in the weeks and months to come as we share more nuggets from our great friend Earl Nightingale thanks for listening today and I'll leave you with a blessing from my mother you know Therese Buffini over her 90 years has showed me by example uh, not only how to solve problems, but actually to think on it, come up with a solution, and overcome it. So I'm going to leave you with an Irish blessing from Mam today. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed today's program. I hope uh, I hope to hear from you. Let me know what you thought, and if you want to hear more of these great Earl Nightingale recordings. Over to you, Mam. May the road rise up to meet you, and may the wind always be at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields and the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. See you next time.